I'm sure somebody else must have recognized this as well. Right? I'm sure somebody else must have recognized Shalom Rastafari. This is a continuation on that point where death by Khazarian circumcision, um, life by black Christ. Maybe that would be a good a good way to, to overstand that right there. But what we're going to touch on now is what we call the circumcised obelisk. So we've been talking about circumcision, right? We've been speaking about circumcision, right? Um, and this kind of go, comes under the, the whole circumcision point, the point of circ, male circumcision. Let's, let's just clarify this right here. What we're talking about is male, right, circum, right, circumcision, right, male circumcision. Now, what do we know about male circumcision? First of all, it is very, very ancient, right? It's a hygienic practice. And in the world today, there are two kinds of circumcision. Basically, the true, which most people don't know. There's some, there's some communities that do know this and practice it, but many don't know. And then there's the popular you know, saying circumcision that is post-Council of Jamina. Council of Jamina. Something you need to look up, the Council of Jamina. The Council of Jamina was, um, was, was, I want to say created, but came about roughly in the year 90 A.D. It came about 20 years after the true Jews or the black Hebrews were murdered, killed, raped, sold into slavery. Many of them fled into Africa. You understand? And from these who fled into Africa, we have remnants within the Beit Israel, the Falasha communities. We also have in other Lemba communities and other places around Africa. Now, there were more Hebrew communities before the outrages of the Gentiles, of the Europeans, as well as of the Mohammedan Harabs or Arabs and Mohammedanism or so-called Islam. You always saying there was more of these communities. Many of them who did survive, they were forced to convert to Islam. So many of them had names like Abraham, but they changed these names to names like Ibrahim. So they changed the name from a Hebrew name, the Hebrew form of the name, to a more acceptable Arabic form of the name. And now a lot of these people in West Africa are being um, kicked off of their land by this increasing tide of um, Islamofascism or radical Islam like Boko Haram and other places around the world. And, and it's, it's very interesting because there's a lot of history. And these people can really look at the real history, but they, you know, they're, they're spirits. You know, we're dealing with spirits here. We're dealing with evil spirits and satanic spirits here. You understand? And we need to understand. We need to understand what's really behind this. That it's a spiritual warfare. Yes, the warfare has kind of come down to this material level, or earthly level. But let's not take our eyes off of the spiritual prize or the overcoming that only can be accomplished by doing. You understand know the will of God in Christ. Period. You understand? Know period. Right there. So male circumcision, we touched on that in the first part, not to go over that. What we want to touch on right here is the connection between male circumcision, right, and the, quote, obelisk, right, the obelisk. Now, you have two kinds of obelisks, basically, in the world, right? You have one which is the Egyptian, right, the Egyptian obelisk, right, and then you have what we call the Aksumite the Aksumite or the Ethiopian obelisk. I think I'll just put Ethiopia here since Egypt in ancient times was a colony of ancient Ethiopia. And Ethiopia's true name, archaic name, is Tobia. Tobia. It's from Tobia that the Greeks got Ethiopia. You know what I'm saying? That the Greeks got Ethiopia and they interpret that as burnt faces. 
but the archaic name of Ethiopia is Tobia. I wrote it here in Gutter's um, uh, Fidelat, right, or Gutter's letters, so those who can read, you understand, know can understand it, or I could put it, you understand, know I could put it right, I could put it right here, so you'll get it right here. Tobia, or that I could be a Y, y sound, Tobia, like Tob, Tobijah in the Bible, or the good Yah. Tobijah in the Bible means the good Yah. Now, the two kind of obelisks we have, we have this one right here, like the Washington obelisk, right? You see the Washington obelisk, which is uncircumcised. And then we have the Ethiopian obelisk, right, which is circumcised, right? The Ethiopian obelisk, which is circumcised, right? And this is what's so very interesting. The only place we have the circumcised obelisk is Ethiopia, or what's known as the Howlet. You understand? The Howlet, you understand, is, is, is circumcised. Right? It's very clear when you look at, my, my drawing here might not do accurate justice to it, but this is very, very interesting. So we have the, the Washington obelisk, like in D.C., you understand? This is like the D.C. obelisk, right? And this is like the Aksum, the Aksum, or some say, say, um, A-X-U-M in English, in Latin letters, Aksum, a X U M or really A K Ak Sum. Some say it come from Wag the Wag Shum. Wag Shum. Right? And that's uh, another that's part of our divine heritage there. What, how this name came about and what the name signifies. But that's not the main point of what we're teaching right here. What we're pointing out is the two types of obelisk. Now, some say that this one right here is actually the bull penis. Right? This actually is not even man penis, but it's, it's a bull penis. Now, this will be kind of correct when we start to um, put together the, the elements of the mythology, the religion, and the popular custom, you understand, of ancient Egypt. Now, many of these obelisks that came from ancient Egypt have been sent around to the so-called city-states of the world especially the three main states. Now, Revelation tells us about these three unclean spirits, right, and, 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 and how the city gets divided into three parts. And it speaks about how Satan, how the devil, is a counterfeiter, right, the counterfeiter. So everyone believes that this is the obelisk. And they see the, they see the Ethiopian one, but they're like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a little different. So, but they, really, they don't understand this. They don't understand this. You know what I'm saying? And many of our people don't understand because as Isaiah chapter 20 says, they should be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation. Now, some folks will say, oh, that's, that's, that, that's something that happened in history. Really? Do you really know how to understand and interpret the prophets? Something that happened before you know, then actually happen again in, in, in a cycle. They only happen at an increasing frequency. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a biblical, you know, hermeneutics and everything can explain why some prophecies that happened before are indications of things to happen, such as what happened with Daniel and Antiochus, Antiochus, Epiphanius, Epiphanes. You understand what he did when he offered swine in the holy place and he defiled it. People say that's the abomination of desolation. Naysayers try to say, oh, that happened then, and these Christians trying to say it's going to happen again. But anyone who does true hermeneutics basically knows that that was a, 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 an indication you know, of a greater abomination to happen again. It's like the old saying that if every time you learn a lesson over again, you have to pay a higher price. You know, I mean, we know this in the mundane. That every time, say, if you go back to school, you didn't graduate before, you go back, you, it, it costs more. It's more expensive. You understand? Um, and in other ways, too, if you get left behind, then all your classmates, you, you know, you feel like, like either stupid or, you know, like all of them went forward and you was left behind. So there's a lot of, the price doesn't always have to be monetary price even though I know that's the spell that a lot of folks are under. So what are these three city-states? These three city-states, 
are putting them in their order are Rome, Lundgren, or what you call London, and then is D.C., District of Columbia in Washington, Washington, right, in Washington, right, Washington, D.C. And we already know that Washington, D.C. is, is built just like, on one level, ancient Egypt, on next level favors Rome and Greece, or even on another level, it is like, um, like, like uh, Solomon's Temple, especially that federal triangle. When you square off the federal triangle, you see that it's, it's, it's a line just like Solomon's Temple. We saw that in the vid, uh, uh, You Shall Know the Truth, or something to that, or Know the Truth TV. Um, a brother out there who put some interesting, one out there who put some interesting vids together. But anyway, these are the three city-states right here, Rome, London, and D.C., and they all have an uncircumcised, right, bull penis. They all have this uncircumcised bull penis right here. While the only place that we have found so far, looking at the various different ancient art and facts, you understand, or artifacts, the place that we find the only circumcised obelisk is in Ethiopia. You understand? Just, it's a small point at first, but as you begin to grind it and, and refine it and, and go into some of the details, especially biblically, it, there's a lot much more. Even this right here, obelisk. Obelisk. You understand? That is not... Um, that is a European, that's a European um, tikkun, I think it was called a tikkun, tikkun in, in um, Hebrew, uh, not Hebrew, in, in, tikkun is Hebrew also, but in ancient um, um, Egypt, I think some would interpret it as tikkun, you understand, tikkun, you know, pronunciations vary among those who, who, you know, are trying to reconstruct the ancient Egyptian language. So this is very interesting right here on the matter of the male circumcision and the uncircumcised bull penis obelisk, which is the popular version of it, seeing that, that now a lot of stuff is coming out, oh, circumcision is bad because they're trying to use these Khazarian Jews or what the Khazarian converts to Judaism the white European Jews, Eastern European Jews, were sucking the blood, you understand, from the penis, as well as cutting off the foreskin. We, we, we had made that um, kind of clear before, and the only example we can give you is like, if this is, if this is the penis right here, right, that there's the foreskin, and the foreskin on the eight-day-old baby is rolled down, and on the bottom side of the penis is a cord, and this cord is just gone across. It's just the cord is split. And when the cord is split, the foreskin rolls down. And as the baby grows, right, as the baby grows, that foreskin basically becomes um, re, reconstituted. You know what I'm saying? It's not flabby or whatever like that. Because remember, this is, this, is, this, is what, this is what goes on in nature. The body is very amazing. This is probably one of the reasons why Yah said to um, Abraham, you know what I'm saying, to do this, you know what I'm saying, to do this, on the eighth day, and we know that Yeshua HaMoshiach also kept this. But then what, what wasn't really so well understood by modern people looking at this ancient custom is the fact, is the fact of the man that there's a hygienic, there's a hygienic um, 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 role and, and, and purpose in True circumcision, and even false circumcision, there's, there's a benefit to degree as long as it's done hygienically and you don't have nobody with herpes lips is sucking the blood out of the baby um, penis, then you probably won't have 11 um, um, Khazarian Jewish boys running around with herpes, even though they never had sexual intercourse, or at least not with a a, a woman, you know, they're not even of bar mitzvah age, so forth and so on. So looking at that element to the hygienic level and the fact that several studies have been done and the European is shaking his head, 
But he says it's science, not religion. Science, it has to be proven scientifically. Well, science basically says that male circumcision in Africa, it promotes life, health, and cleansiness, and a lot of women are not getting AIDS because of it, and a lot of the men are not getting HIV, and a whole lost generation is not being created by this because of the male circumcision as well as abstinence. Yes, we said it, abstinence. You understand? Of course the world doesn't want to teach abstinence. You, you notice a thing that the world don't like, but then if you follow the thing that the world encourages you to do, you see that it leads to death. A death and death prematurely and death horribly. You know what we're saying? So who are you going to believe? Who are you going to accept as true, as speaking the truth? So female circumcision, before we just get off this point right here, right, female circumcision is an abomination. And, and sisters, especially sisters of I and I order, daughters of Ethiopia as well, um, I encourage you to investigate and study that particular issue because a lot of women, African women and girls are suffering, you know what I'm saying, are, are suffering some horrible outrages, you know what I'm saying, and the only thing that even the Ethiopians who, who do this horrible, unbiblical, ungodly practice can say is tradition, you know, it's tradition, you understand, but what does Christ say, a lot of them will say they're Christians too, Unbiblical, many of them, but they will say they're Christians too. You understand? Um, there's, there is no reason for it. In fact, it's very devilish what, what they do. Because what they do in female circumcision is not even cut off to so much the four, the four, the four skin. Even though cutting off, cutting off anything, that all that's cut, what's cut, what's going around is, is, is that cord is that cord. That's the only thing that's cut on the eighth day, on the eighth day. Later on, you know what I'm saying, did it become more of a, you know where the, where, where the cutting off of the skin can be attributed to? What happened with Shechem? You remember Shechem in Genesis? Check out Shechem in Genesis. Maybe in another lecture we'll go through that. But look at Shechem after Dina, the story of Dina. Remember Dina or Dinah, um, the, the daughter of the 12 sons, and, and Levi and, 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 um, and Levi and Simeon, what they did when Shechem allegedly had raped Dina, the disobedient Israelite girl, you understand, who went to the party. She went to a little rave, a little house party, you understand, with the Canaanites and stuff. Somebody saw her there, maybe it was a little date rape drug back in the old days. And, yeah, they had things to knock you out. You know, there's still things, but we're, you know, we're city life, so all we got is the pharmacy, whatever like that. But, anyway, she went there, some, some prince, Shechem, saw her, he liked her, you understand? And so what did he do? He got with her. And when he got with her, you understand, um, you know, I think she probably got pregnant. The Bible is kind of silent on that. But um, he wanted to marry her. And the Israelite sons, you, you know how we can be brothers, you know what I mean? Even you Hebrews, we Hebrews, and some, you know, without that grace of Christ, you know, um, you know how violent, you know, we as black men can be, especially, you understand, if we think we're in the right. And that's how these brothers got, you understand? But they, they did it with such devious, devilish cunning. That's the part. Because what they said was, have Shechem and all the males. We cannot join with Jacob. He said, yo, this is, it's not too good, but all things works with the good of, the, you know, of God and those who love the Lord. You know, that was his kind of idea. And he said, let's be family with these people because we're strangers in this land. We don't want to cause no problem. But the sons were like, no way. Those some uncircumcised heathen. Okay, here's what we do. We tell them to be circumcised. And the trick was that it was the other circumcision that has become popular now where the skin is pulled above the glands and that excess skin is cut off, which is extremely painful. I'm so happy I don't remember when it was done to me, and most of us probably don't remember when they had some anesthetics or whatever. But still, it's not what Jah commanded. So where that other circumcision most likely came from, but still we don't have nothing about Abraham, 
drinking the blood from from his son's penis or whatnot like that is I don't want to say it, but but just let you know that that is not kosher, that is not kasha, that's not kash root. You understand? And even many of the of the converted Jews are beginning to cut that particular tradition because they don't know of what the Bible, the true tradition. You understand the true tradition, which is yes, it's a little painful cutting that little cord, but it's not like cutting off, cutting off of flesh, which can also harm the the sensitive glands and other um, organs, and in some worst case scenarios, can cause um, sterility and other kind of uh, um, issues in the in the male member. Anyway. More to come on this. Uh, Shalom Rastafari.